Profile of a Pedophile, Why Michael Jackson Fits the Bill. Hey everyone, I'm Roxanne and welcome back to my channel. Now today we're going to do yet another video on Michael Jackson. As I was doing some digging, I was realizing how many of Michael Jackson's behaviors actually matched the behavioral pattern in the criminal profile of child predators. And it wasn't just one or two idiosyncrasies. I realized that most of Jackson's behaviors outside of his creative genius were red flags that no one would have suspected. What I found blew my mind and really showed the disparity between what the general public thought of as typical of a sex offender and what the actual reality was according to research and law enforcement investigations. So in this video, we're going to be doing a behavioral analysis of Michael Jackson and comparing it to the criminal profile of pedophilic behaviors. And just to show you some of the resources I'll be using, I'll be referencing Child Molesters, a behavioral analysis for law enforcement officers investigating cases of child sexual exploitation. And this was written by Kenneth V. Lanning in cooperation with the Federal Bureau of Investigation. I'll also be using a profile of pedophilia, definition, characteristics of offenders, recidivism, treatment outcomes, and forensic issues, published in Focus Magazine. The book Profiling Violent Crimes, an investigative tool by Ronald and Steve Holmes, Emotional Congruence in Sexual Offenders Against Children by Robin J. Wilson, Explaining Emotional Congruence with Children by Dr. Craig Harper, Perpetrators of Child Sexual Abuse by the National Institute of Public Health of Quebec, and Pedophiles, Hebophiles, and Ephebophiles, Oh My, Erotic Age Orientation by Jesse Baring, published in Scientific American. So there's quite a lot of resources handy to help us understand the behavioral clusters of pedophiles. And things I'll be comparing these patterns of behavior with are very interviews of Michael Jackson throughout the 80s, 90s, and early 2000s. Interviews with the people who knew him quite closely, like the Casio family, people like Omer Bati, Macaulay Culkin, of course, Wade Robson and James Safechuck, and their mothers, Joy Robson and Stephanie Safechuck. We'll be looking at photographs of Michael Jackson with the boys he surrounded himself with, like Jonathan Spence, Brett Barnes, Omer Bati, and the Casio brothers, among others. We'll be looking at things like Jackson's marriage to Lisa Marie Presley, his marriage to Debbie Rowe, and of course a lot of the pop star's idiosyncrasies and behaviors, at least what's been revealed to the public. We'll also be looking at what people like Taj and Brandy Jackson had to say about Michael when they interacted with him as children. Trust me, there's a lot to discuss. There's a lot of footage and interviews and photographs of Michael Jackson that we can analyze. And trust me, these videos and photographs photographs have a lot to say when we break them down. So guys, content warning, we're going to be discussing some very graphic details that are potentially quite triggering and quite disturbing. So if that's not for you, you know what to do. But for everybody else, buckle your seatbelts and let's get into it. I am not guilty of these allegations. It's just a slumber party. We just have a lot of fun. They've been destroyed. I see God in the face of children. What kind of evidence do you have? I saw what I saw. Nothing happened. You know, I mean, nothing. Why don't you share your bed? Do you still think that it's acceptable to share your bed with children? So first of all, what is a pedophile? You know, the common misconception is that it's some creepy, dirty old man who lures young children into some suspicious looking unmarked white van. And this is why a lot of his fans will say that Michael Jackson could never have been a predator. He just does not fit the profile. During his heyday of being a pop star, he was relatively young, attractive, very charming, even a bit shy. Michael could never have done the things that Wade Robson and James Safechuck accused him of doing. But unfortunately, the more accurate profile of a pedophile is very far from the public perception. According to the behavioral analysis by Kenneth V. Lanning, a pedophile's sexual preference for children usually begins in early adolescence, and many predators start committing offenses during their teenage years. Did you know there are also different kinds of pedophiles? That's right, there's not just one all-encapsulating profile. There are pedophiles that prefer different age ranges, body types, genders, and even target specific ethnicities. According to Holmes's book, Profile 
profiling violent crimes, an investigative tool, there are situational child molesters. And these are offenders who don't have a true sexual interest in children, but rather will abuse and prey on any vulnerable person. And if a child happens to be in the way, then they might turn to the child as a temporary object of sexual gratification. But these kind of predators might usually be attracted to adults. Then you have the preferential child molester or preferential pedophile. And according to Holmes, there are two subtypes of the preferential pedophile, the mysoped and the fixated. The mysoped child molester is someone who's made a vital connection between sexual gratification and extreme personal violence. And these are the kinds that might commit sadistic sexual acts with children. In other words, causing pain and suffering actually stimulates sexual arousal. And these are the types of offenders that usually end up killing the victim and then moving on to the next target. This definitely does not describe Michael Jackson, not from what Wade Robson and James Safechuck detail about him in various various interviews and how he interacted with his victims. But the next subtype of preferential pedophile is the fixated child molester. And this person is fixated in terms of being stuck at a certain age in their psychosocial development. I like how this New York Times article describes it. In the article, Preying on Children, the Emerging Psychology of Pedophiles by Benedict Carey, fixated pedophiles, quote, discover usually as teenagers that their sexual preferences have not matured like everyone else's. Most get stuck on the same age boys or girls who first attracted them at the start of puberty. And what's interesting is that not only does their sexual attraction get stuck at a certain age, but even their psychosocial development gets trapped at that age as well. And this is what's called emotional congruence with children, or ECWC. And guys, this is perhaps the most important element of behavior we're going to be looking at while we analyze Michael Jackson. And I'll show you why. For most normal children growing up, we grow and mature physically and emotionally and psychologically. And as we do, our behaviors, our interests, our attractions change and mature with the rest of our peers. A five-year-old might like certain toys and children when they're five, but as they grow, age six, age seven, age eight, the child no longer wants to play with the same toys or watch the same cartoons or play with little kids. They'll mix and mingle with children their own age and as they enter adolescence, they'll want to have adolescent friends. All children go through a phase of development where they want to establish themselves as more independent young adults. Eventually, they won't want to be seen as children anymore. They don't want to be treated like little kids. They'll reject too much parental control, which is a normal progression in your teen years. And finally, at ages 18, 19, and 20, they're on to more grown-up things, maybe looking forward to moving away for college and pursuing their adult interests and friends. But for the fixated pedophile, this isn't the case. The fixated pedophile reaches a point of arrested development and gets fixed at a certain age, no longer progressing with the rest of their peers. And you'll begin to notice that as they age and grow, their interests and friends don't. At ages 13, 14, and 15, this person is still hanging out and socializing with 10 and 11 year olds. They're not interested in their peers. They're still attracted to the same toys and entertainment and age group of children, even when they've reached ages of 17, 18, and 19. And this is what's called emotional congruence with children. This person isn't just sexually attracted to 10, 11, 11 or 12 year olds. This individual has more in common with a 12 year old than they do with adults their same age. And this, my friends, is why Michael Jackson was constantly befriending young children, particularly young boys from around ages nine to age 13. It wasn't due to some benevolent innocence that Michael had as a unique character trait. Michael Jackson was fixated in his psychosocial development and his romantic interests. And this is is a theme that you're going to see with Michael Jackson over and over again as we analyze his behaviors, this emotional congruence with children or ECWC. A lot of times you're going to hear the defense, Michael would never do that to a child. Michael was like a nine-year-old boy. He was like a child himself. He wasn't a predator. He would ask us, what's a birthday party like? You know, you're hanging out with all these friends. Tell me about it. What's, what's it like? I didn't get to do that. Tell me about that. You know what we did? We played hide and go seek. That's, that's my uncle. What grown man in his 30s or 40s plays hide and go seek? 
He was just like a child, yes. Acted like a little boy, giggling. He's a child himself. He would always sneak away from the adult table and come sit at the kid table. And he wants to play hide and go seek and tag and all of those sort of things. But guess what? According to a 2013 study by Ian McPhail and Chantel Herman, emotional congruence with children is more prevalent as a predictive factor among extra familial predators, particularly those with male victims. So not only is this childish arrested development a risk factor for this type of pedophile, but it also tends to be more prevalent in pedophiles that prefer males or homosexual pedophiles. I want to stop here for a sec because I want to be very careful in saying there are no scientific studies or research that links homosexuality or same-sex attraction to pedophilia. There are heterosexual pedophiles and same-sex attracted pedophiles. And as a matter of fact, the majority of child sexual abuse offenders are heterosexual. The reason I'm looking at male pedophiles attracted to male victims is because all of the persons who've come out out and claim that Michael Jackson abused them are all men. There has not been one woman who has come out to say that Jackson abused them either in childhood or adulthood. So I'm moving forward with this on the basis that if the allegations are true, Michael Jackson was a same-sex attracted predator. Okay, let's continue. The idea that the more childlike an adult is, the less likely they are to be a sexual predator actually goes against the extensive scientific research on pedophilia. Evidence actually shows the opposite. According to a 2014 study by Ian McPhail and Chantal Herman, correlates of emotional congruence with children in sexual offenders with children, the findings were that persons with high levels of emotional congruence with children also had high levels of sexual preoccupation with children. McPhail and Herman's study concluded that emotional congruence with children is associated with higher levels of deviant sexual interests, sexual self-regulation problems, cognitions that condone and support child molestation, and social rejection and loneliness. Michael Jackson having this relatability with children, being able to talk for hours on the phone with them, playing with them at Neverland with video games and slumber parties, pillow fights and water balloon fights, and gender Generally acting like a child, most people interpreted this as a sign that Jackson was safe and innocuous. But according to the research, this was ironically enough Jackson's biggest red flag. Now we're going to get into gender preferences and body types or chronophilia, which is an age-based sexual attraction pattern. But the next thing I really want to look at is some of the personality traits or characteristics of a pedophile. And I want to stress that these are cluster behaviors, meaning that by themselves, they're not indicative of someone being a pedophile. But when you put them all together, these cluster characteristics is what criminal profilers use to determine the risk factor of this person being a child predator. So according to Quebec's National Institute of Public Health, pedophiles have certain personality characteristics, and these include poor social skills, strained relationships with adults, low self-esteem or self-devaluation, vulnerability in regard to their masculinity, feelings of humiliation, loneliness, and emotional attachment problems. Now we all know Michael Jackson had severe self-esteem issues with regard to how he looked, especially when he stopped being that cute little kid as the lead singer of the Jackson 5. Some lady recognized my brothers and all of us. She goes, oh my God, it's the Jackson 5. Where's little Michael? Where's little Michael? She's looking around, looking down. Where's little Michael? And, and, and another person goes, there he is. And she goes, ugh, what happened? Just like that. And God, I just could have died right there. Is it true that your father used to say you had a fat nose? Yeah. What did he say? What did he actually say? God, your nose is big. You didn't get it from me. What does that do to someone who's going through adolescence? You want to die. And on top of it, you got to go on stage in the spotlight in front of hundreds of thousands of people and just, God, it's just hard. I would have been happier wearing a mask. In terms of having strained relationships with adults, we know that generally Michael Jackson made it known that he preferred the company of children to adults. Do you think it would be true to say that you found friendship and inspiration in children that you haven't been able to find in adults? That's absolutely the truth. Really? 
Yes. Yes. I feel totally at home with them. I can talk to them one on one because they don't judge you. You know, they're not looking for anything. They just want to have some fun. I haven't been betrayed or deceived by children. Adults have let me down. Adults have let the world down. He also tended to keep his family at a distance. Michael asks you, would you cry if Joseph died? What did Michael say after he asked you that question? He said he don't know if he would or he wouldn't. He withdrew from the reach of his family. You say that from, what is it, 1984 to 1992, you saw Michael maybe three times a year during that period? Yes. You sent him letters, yes. packages, but he never responded to any of them? No. Why didn't he want to see you, Jermaine? It's not that he didn't want to see me. He could have picked up the phone and seen yes. me anytime he wanted. No, Michael don't call. And it could have been a lot of influence from outside people saying, uh, your family's going to hold you back. Now, granted, it was no secret that Joe Jackson was very abusive, so I'm sure there was a lot of trauma there that he was avoiding. And he, he practiced us with a belt in his hand. And if you miss a step, expect to be... Uh, and he would tear you up if you missed. And so we, not only were we practicing, we were nervous rehearsing, because he sat in the chair and he had this belt in his hand. And if you didn't do it the right way, he would tear you up. But again, just another one of these profile traits he had in terms of his emotional attachments with adults, or lack thereof. Jackson also admitted to struggling with feelings of loneliness. You often seem very lonely. Is that, is that true? I used to be very lonely. Painful lonely. So, you have no idea. I used to walk the streets Looking for people to talk to. You do seem so isolated. Look too isolated. And you do seem so lonely. Once I got off stage, I was like very sad. It's lonely, sad, having to face with popularity and all of that. Uh, there were times when I had great times with my brothers, pillow fights and things, but I was always, I used to always cry from loneliness. Now, in looking at vulnerability in regard to his masculinity, we can definitely see that throughout Michael's entire career, there were a lot of questions about his sexuality and whether he was gay. During the trial, when he's wearing eyeliner and what appears to be lipstick. He didn't like the line that was drawn between what's allowed for men and what's allowed for women. He really was very androgynous in the sense that he just took whatever is available to enhance himself as art. He certainly didn't have your typical masculine traits in terms of his mannerisms and the way he spoke in this very soft, high-pitched voice. I get embarrassed easily and, uh, I don't know, sometimes, the, the time, I'm most comfortable on stage than any place in the world. Uh, being around, you know, everyday people and stuff, I feel strange, I do. Sure. Yeah. He also kept himself very thin. There were questions of whether or not Michael Jackson suffered from an eating disorder. I wouldn't eat. Took the spoon and would put it in my mouth. When I get really upset and hurt, I don't eat. I go on a food. I just, I just eat. So I'm unconscious. Then they started doing it intravenously. The only thing that I could control in my life was Motown, was, was, was eating. I had no control. We had no control. But typically most men want to gain weight and muscle mass while Michael kept up this very slight frame. Here's something I found very interesting if we go back to the article by Quebec's National Institute of Public Health. It says experts have developed three different profiles of child sexual abusers. The isolated pedophile, the orderly pedophile, and the festive pedophile. And for the isolated pedophile, which is a profile I think fits Michael Jackson the closest, it says in terms of lifestyle, this person person is usually not involved in a romantic relationship and lives alone. And we know Michael Jackson up until 1993 was for the most part a single male. He had those two dubious and very brief marriages to Lisa Marie Presley and Debbie Rowe. His marriage to Lisa Marie was literally only 20 months, so not even two years. Some even say it was as short as 18 months. His marriage to Debbie Rowe was longer at three years from 1996 to 19. 
1999. But we all know that marriage was more transactional than because of any romantic attractions. Debbie Rowe, of course, gave birth to Paris and Prince Michael, but Michael Jackson didn't share paternity with these children. And it seems he ensured he married Debbie Rowe so that he had paternal rights to the kids. It's doubtful he even ever had sexual relations with these two women, and these were more like sham marriages. I felt I was disposable. You divorced, and several months later, I know by October, it was announced that Debbie Rowe was pregnant. Mm -hmm. He would come tell me, if you're not going to do it, Debbie said she'll do it. And I was like, what is that? He would be like, well, if you're not going to, this person will. Are you going to do it or not? Mm -hmm. And That's what you mean by disposable. Yes. And we'll definitely get into the tendency of pedophiles to engage in fake marriages that they use as a cover for themselves. But let's get back to the isolated pedophile profile. The next thing the profile gets into is characteristics of the sexual abuse committed. For the isolated pedophile, sexual abuse is premeditated but does not involve coercion. It's intended to establish a climate of trust so that an intimate relationship can be developed with a victim. The isolated pedophile also more often targets male victims, and the abuse consists primarily of sexual acts involving fellatio and masturbation. Guys, these characteristics described here are very consistent with what Wade Robson and James Safechuck described. They're consistent with the written testimony of Jordan Chandler, which we'll be getting into, and they're consistent with the testimony of Gavin Arvizo to police. The way Robson and Safechuck described it in Leaving Neverland, Jackson never used force. Wade will say there was nothing abrasive in the way Michael touched him. You know, there was nothing aggressive about it, nothing abrasive. I never felt uh, scared or anything like that. That he would guide his hands to Jackson's nether regions. James Safechuck said Michael would ask if he could kiss it, meaning kiss Safechuck's genitals. He started with, like, kiss it. Can I kiss it? And eventually, these would turn into long-term romantic relationships with these boys. They'd sleep together in the same bed, they'd travel on tour with him, they'd talk on the phone for hours. Something interesting Wade Robson mentioned is that when Michael would become sexual with him again, it made him feel more secure that he wasn't going to be replaced by another boy. So every time that it was just he and I again, and the sexual stuff would happen again, like, made me feel a little better made me feel like things were okay again and things were back to normal and that feeling didn't stay for long because um, I would keep coming up against scenarios where there was another boy. So definitely these were not coercive relationships, but what's being described, by the accusers anyway, is a very gentle progression into these sexual interactions, which largely never involved anal penetration, but revolved around masturbation and oral sex. Wade Robson said there was only one occurrence towards the end of their relationship where Wade was about 14, and this was when Jackson tried to penetrate him anally, but it was too painful for him, so they went back into the routine of masturbation and oral sex. So again, if you're making the argument that all of these men coming forward are making things up, they're lying, how strange that the sexual interactions they're describing are all similar. None of them involved rape or coercion or anything physically rough or abusive. And you'd think if all these different men are coming forward with these lies about sexual abuse just so they can have a piece of the Jackson estate, why are all of these descriptions of the sexual interactions so similar? There are so many different ways you could be sexually abused. They could have been raped anally or also verbally degraded, manhandled with choking or gagging. But no, none of these men describe any kind of sexual violence with Jackson. Just a slow, gentle progression into these non-invasive acts that weren't physically painful and involved these long-term romances. One of Jackson's chauffeurs described seeing Michael Jackson French kissing a nine-year-old boy in the back seat, and he said it was, quote, like they were lovers. So there's definitely a consistent sexual behavior being described when it comes to the allegations. Here's another thing that's very consistent with Jordan Chandler, Wade Robson, James Safechuck, and even Wade's mother, Joy Robson. This description of Michael crying. In Jordan Chandler's affidavit, he said if he didn't want to engage in a certain sex act, Michael would start crying. He'd ask if he could do something to the boy, and if Jordy said he didn't like that, Michael would cry. And Wade 
Wade Robson said on what was supposed to be his last night at Neverland, he saw Jackson in the corner crying because Wade was going to leave him. I could hear like crying, like sulking and sobbing. You know, I don't want to be alone. I don't want you guys to leave. Like he was so upset. And Joy Robson said when she asked Michael about the allegations, again, Michael would start crying and say he could never hurt a child. I can hear him saying to me, I would never hurt a child. He would cry. I could never hurt a child and he would break into tears. So again, this is a very specific behavior being described by multiple accusers. And you'd think because these are all very different people. For the most part, they didn't know each other and had never met. You know, Michael Jacobs Hagen wasn't in the picture for very long like the other boys. Yet his description of himself and Michael Jackson rubbing up against each other when they were in bed, very similar to Jordan Chandler's description of Jackson making them lie on top of each other with erections. Jordan Chandler affidavit said in paragraph 12 the next step was when Michael Jackson rubbed up against me in bed the next step was when we would lie on top of each other with erections now take note of Michael Jacobs Hagen's account of his experience with Jackson would there be any contact between his body and your body yes I mean we was together our bodies was together I was on this side and he was behind me and he put his arm around me. Pressed up against you? Yes. W was there ever anything sexual that happened between you? The bodies together, you know? The bodies, that's why he also, my rubber rubber friend, you know? I mean. What does that mean? Rubber rubber is that you put your two bodies together, you know? As in rubbing up against each other. Yes, this is exactly what, what is wubba wubba. And why not make the allegations more extreme? I think this is very telling when it comes to the consistency in each of their stories of these very specific behaviors. Okay, now the next thing I want to get into is something called erotic age orientation or chronophilia. And this is any type of age-based sexual attraction pattern. So in other words, it's the age range or age group that the sex offender is attracted to. So certain child predators might like prepubescent children anywhere from ages five through 10. And by the way, child predators are given classifications based on the age range they have sexual interest in. And there's different classifications. So a person who is attracted to infants and toddlers is called a nepiophile or infantophile. And they're interested in children anywhere from ages zero to two. Predators attracted to prepubescent children are called pedophiles. And this is the truest meaning of the word. The term pedophile tends to be largely and informally used to describe all child sex offenders, regardless of the age range they're attracted to. But the literal meaning of the word pedophile is someone attracted to prepubescent children, and that could be a child anywhere from ages 3 to 10. Persons attracted to children on the cusp of puberty in their early teens or tweens are called hebophiles, so they might be attracted to a child anywhere from ages 11 to 14. Persons attracted to children in their late teens, ages 15 to 17, are called ephebophiles. And finally, persons who are attracted to more mature children ages 17 years and older are called teliophiles. Now there's some debate about how to judge what age group a child predator is attracted to, whether you should use the literal age of the child or their body type. And actually physical body type might be more accurate because a child who is 12, for example, might be a bit delayed in their development and look more like a nine-year-old. And another child the same age might be more progressed in their physical development and look closer to a 15 year old. So in that case, even though the pedophile might be attracted in general to a certain age range, they might also target someone younger or older, depending on that child's physical development. So something researchers and law enforcement like to use is called the Tanner stages of physical sexual development. Just a warning here, I'm going to show a video clip of Dr. Craig Harper explaining and showing the Tanner stages of development and how different kinds of child predators might be attracted to different stages of physical development. And this includes illustrations of bodies at different stages of development, so just be warned here. But just to demonstrate what the Tanner stages look like, um, essentially what we're looking at in uh, females is, um, or in girls and women, we're looking at kind of breast development and pubic hair growth. 
um, and in boys and uh, adolescent uh, adolescent boys, we're looking at uh, genital growth and pubic hair growth. And what we're suggesting is that uh, people who are paedophilic uh, typically will be attracted to uh, kind of a Tanner stage two uh, body type. Now this doesn't necessarily mean that somebody um, who is attracted to a Tanner stage three um, isn't uh, paedophilic, but at the same time, what we're suggesting is that these are typical body types that correspond to uh, specific chronophilic subtypes. So hebophiles, for example, will be attracted to a Tanner stage three to a Tanner stage four. If hebophiles will typically be attracted to a Tanner stage four, possibly a Tanner stage five. Did you guys know that pedophilia could be this complex? I'm sure no one did. Also, these age range classifications don't mean that a pedophile can't be attracted to more than one age group or have a larger age range of what they find sexually arousing. But knowing that there are different types of pedophiles that are attracted to different age ranges or body types, this begs the question, what type of pedophile do you think Michael Jackson might have allegedly been? Well, let's take a look at some of the boys Jackson would surround himself with. Obviously, there was Wade Rock Robson and James Safechuck. There was Macaulay Culkin, Corey Feldman, Sean Lennon, Emmanuel Lewis, Frank and Eddie Cassio, Jonathan Spence, Brett Barnes, Omer Bati, Jordan Chandler, and Gavin Arvizo. I know this is only a handful, guys, in comparison to how many boys Jackson actually knew and spent time with, but let's look at these 13 kids and see what they have in common. Well, the first thing that I think is the most obvious is they're all boys. Sure, some of these children had siblings who were girls, but I think these boys had the primary focus when it came to how Michael Jackson related to them and their families. So let's try to look at things in chronological order here. First, you had Emmanuel Lewis, who met Jackson back in 1983 at the age of 12 and would continue being friends with the singer until the age of 22. Then you had Jonathan Spence, who also met Jackson in 1983 when he was about 10 years old and their relationship continued until he was 16. You had Sean Lennon, the son of John Lennon and Yoko Ono, who also met Jackson in 1983 at the age of eight years old and would remain close friends with him until he was 15. Then you have Corey Feldman, who met Jackson in 1984 at the age of 13, and their relationship would last into Feldman's adult years, with them finally falling out in 2001 when Feldman was 30 years old. Then you had Frank and Eddie Cassio, who first met Jackson in 1985 at the age of 5 and 3 respectively. But it was at the ages of 12 and 10 that they first got invited to the Neverland Ranch and spent hundreds of nights sleeping in the same bed as Jackson and accompanied him on the dangerous tour when they were 13 and 11. Their relationship with the singer lasted into adulthood. Then there's James Safechuck, who first met Michael Jackson in 1987 at the age of 9, but claims his sexual abuse started at around age 10 when he accompanied Jackson on his bad tour in 1988. But the relationship pretty much ended in 1993 when Safechuck was 15. Next you have Wade Robson, who first met Jackson in 1987 at the age of 5, but claims the abuse started in 1990 on his first visit to Neverland when Robson was 7 and ended when he was 14. Then you have Macaulay Culkin, who met Jackson at the height of Culkin's career in 1991 at the age of 10 with the success of Home Alone. Alone, and their relationship would continue to be close until he was 14. Then there was Brett Barnes, who met Jackson in 1991 at the age of 9, and their friendship would continue well into Brett's adult years. Then you had Jordan Chandler, who first met Michael Jackson in 1992 at the age of 12, and of course in 1993 made the first allegations of sexual abuse that Jackson faced, so obviously that relationship didn't last very long. Then there's Omer Bati who met the singer in 1996 at age 11 and a year later actually moved to Neverland. His mother became the nanny for Jackson's children and Omer remained friends with the singer until he died in 2009 when Omer was 24. Then you have Gavin Arvizo, who met Jackson in the year 2000 when he was 10 years old and suffering from cancer. In 2002, Gavin was invited to Neverland to take part in the Martin Bashir documentary Living with Michael Jackson. And of of course, later in 2003, when it aired, 
police decided to investigate Jackson for child molestation. So totaled up out of these 13 boys, the average age these children would meet Michael Jackson was around age nine. Six of these boys continued their relationship with Jackson into their adult years, with the other seven having a relationship with a singer between the ages of 12 to 16. So the average age these boys would no longer correspond with Jackson would be at around 14 years old. So what average age range did Jackson have a particular interest in. It's hard to tell exactly because for many of the boys who continued their friendships with Jackson into adulthood, you might not be able to say whether Jackson gave them the same attentiveness he did when they were in their childhood years. Many of these children said they would talk to Jackson on the phone for hours and were frequently invited to the Neverland Ranch for slumber parties in Jackson's bed while they were ages 10 through 14 like the Casio brothers. But did this level of close interaction continue as they became older? Older, even though they still remain friends? I doubt it. Wade Robson also remained friends with the singer into his adult years, but claimed the sexual abuse ended at age 14. And they also didn't speak to or see each other as frequently after that. So it might be safe to say the age range Michael Jackson had a special interest in was from ages 9 to 14. If the allegations were true, Jackson's erotic age orientation would have made him closer to a hebophile, which is someone who has a sexual preference for children at the cusp of puberty between the ages of 11 and 14. The next significant observation about these kids you could make is that all of these children were extremely attractive and tended to be white or at least have very Eurocentric features. Which brings us to another characteristic of pedophiles. Many child sexual predators have racial preferences or a partiality towards a particular ethnic group. It can be due to aesthetic preferences, but it can also be because certain ethnic communities, due to economic vulnerability, are also more vulnerable to sexual predation. One of Britain's most prolific pedophiles was a man named Richard Huckle, who tended to target children from East Asian communities. It could have been because of Huckle's own aesthetic preferences on what he considers attractive. But Southeast Asian communities in Britain are filled with many new immigrant families facing poverty and language barriers, which was a vulnerability Huckle took advantage of as an English second language teacher. There's even sexual tourism, where predators, often from white majority first world countries, will travel to more impoverished countries where sex trafficking laws are more lax and they can have easier access access to sexually exploited women and children. When it comes to the children who were considered a part of Jackson's inner circle, I personally believe aesthetics played a huge role. These children were gorgeous, and I suppose they would be. The majority of children Michael Jackson surrounded himself with, outside of his charity efforts and philanthropy, were children in the entertainment industry. Actors, dancers, children he would later let star with him in his music videos or commercials, or children who were rising stars in their own right. These were very attractive kids, not to mention Michael Jackson's own preoccupation with his looks. With the series of plastic surgeries and skin lightening he had over the course of his career, it almost seemed as if Jackson wanted to embody the aesthetic characteristics of the children he surrounded himself with. Fair skin, pouty red lips, and a small upturned nose. This brings us to another characteristic of a pedophile. According to the study by Ryan and Richard C.W. Hall, a profile of pedophilia, it's common for people who are diagnosed as having pedophilia to also experience another major psychiatric disorder or a diagnosable personality disorder. Michael Jackson struggled with his own self-image, and though he denied having any more than two plastic surgeries, he seemed very much addicted to having cosmetic procedures done on his face and would also become addicted to painkillers and sleep aids. According to the Hall study, 50 to 60% of surveyed convicted pedophiles suffered from anxiety disorders. They also experienced feelings of inferiority, isolation, loneliness, low self-esteem, internal dysphoria, and emotional immaturity. The mention of internal dysphoria is very interesting because we know that there were several things Michael Jackson would express that he was uncomfortable with about himself. His broad African-American nose and dark skin complexion, both of which he said his father Joseph Jackson would regularly criticize him for. And of course, there was his desire to be Peter Pan, a child who never ages. The inspiration for Neverland, Peter Pan, 
Why is Peter Pan a figure of such interest and inspiration to you? Because Peter Pan, to me, um, represents something that's very special in my heart. You know, he represents youth, childhood, never growing up, magic, flying, everything I think that children and wonderment and magic, what it's all about. And to me, I just have never, ever grown out of loving that or thinking that is very special. Do you identify with him? Totally. You don't want to grow up? No, I am Peter Pan. No, you're not. You're Michael Jackson. I'm Peter Pan, my heart. Thank you to Clyde, soaring up so high. Watch me now, watch me now. I'm Peter Pan, I can do anything. I would love to come back as, 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 a, as a child and as a growth old like Peter Pan. With that alongside his rumored eating disorder, one wonders if this was an internal dysphoria or some kind of body dysmorphia that the singer suffered from. Maybe this was also the inspiration for some of his song lyrics like, it don't matter if you're black or white, I'm not gonna spend my life being a color, and don't you black or white me. I'm not gonna spend my life being a color. Perhaps Jackson felt limited by being associated with his race, an ethnicity with which he wasn't comfortable to begin with. Certainly the families he inserted himself into were not African-American families. These were, for the most part, white suburban families, perhaps representing an upbringing he wished he had. Jackson often mourned his abusive childhood and spoke openly about regrets like not being able to call his father daddy instead of Joseph and working constantly instead of being allowed to play. And he didn't allow us to call him daddy and I wanted to call him daddy so bad. He said, I'm not daddy, I'm Joseph to you, you know? Interestingly, in a study by Robin J. Wilson, Emotional Congruence in Sexual Offenders Against Children, in order to gauge the amount of emotional congruence a sex offender might have with a child, the study was conducted on a sample of 194 male sexual offenders who took part in a questionnaire called a Child Identification Scale. Questions answered in the affirmative for individuals with high emotional congruence with children were statements like, I often wish I could remain a child and not grow Grown up. I enjoy myself most when I am playing with children. I like to treat children as equals. I feel closer to children than adults. I often wish I could be young again. I often find it difficult to act my age. I like to look through toy stores. Childhood was difficult for me. And my family and friends think I am immature. Certainly, if Michael Jackson were given the child identification scale with questions like these, he would probably come out with a very high score. Jackson constantly fed the public a narrative of a man desperately wanting to relive the childhood he never had vicariously through the children he surrounded himself with. Have you seen my childhood? Another interesting conclusion from the Wilson study was that the child identification scale revealed that the scores particularly of homosexual pedophiles indicated a preference for interacting with children on the child's level. And look at this, it says homosexual pedophiles seem more persistent in their interest in children and childhood. Going back to the FBI profile on child molesters by Kenneth Lanning, another indicator is that pedophiles have hobbies and interests that are appealing to children. Quote, pedophiles might collect toys or dolls, build model planes or boats, or perform as clowns or magicians to attract children. Pedophiles attracted to teenage boys might have their homes decorated the way a teenage boy would. This might include toys, games, stereos, rock posters, and so on. The homes of some pedophiles have been described as shrines to children or as miniature amusement parks. People, I don't think we could have a more accurate description of what Neverland was than what's in this profile analysis. And this profile was published in 1992, before the first sexual abuse allegations, so it's not based on anything related to Michael Jackson. Yet we're seeing so many of Jackson's behaviors and idiosyncrasies being described. Neverland was Michael Jackson's shrine to children. 
children. The videos recorded by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office are a major indicator. Jackson's home was filled with dolls and toys and pictures of Peter Pan. It was a child's wonderland. And of course, not to mention the amusement park rides, zoo, and candy store. Getting back to the behavioral analysis by Lanning, preferential pedophiles, meaning sex offenders who have a specific preference for children, also display an excessive interest in children, frequently socializing with children as their circle of friends, and also have an idealistic view of them that's often expressed in their language and writing, referring to children using words like clean, pure, and innocent. This definitely describes Michael Jackson. He had an excessive interest in children, had them as his close circle of friends, and definitely idealized them. I told, I've said it many times, my greatest inspiration comes from kids. Every song I write, every dance I do, all the poetry I write, is all inspired from that level of innocence, that consciousness of purity. And children have that. I see God in the face of children. And um, man, uh, I just love being around that, that all the time. When I see children, I see the face of God. That's why I love them so much. And I try to imitate Jesus and not, I'm not saying I am Jesus, I'm not saying... Yeah, I, we're clear on that. Right, I'm we're trying clear. to imitate Jesus in the fact that he said to be like children, mm -hmm. to love children, to be as pure as children are, mm -hmm. and to make yourselves as innocent and see the world through eyes of, of wonderment and, and the whole magical quality of it all. And I love that. You seen my child. According to Lanning, pedophiles usually have the ability to identify with children better than they do with adults, a trait that makes most pedophiles master seducers of children. They especially know how to listen to children. Many pedophiles are described as pied pipers who attract children. Again, this was a huge characteristic of Michael Jackson and goes back to what researchers called emotional congruence with children. Jackson would talk for hours on the phone with these boys. He would talk to Wade for sometimes six, seven hours at a time. And you'll note that there are no little girls that said they enjoyed these long telephone calls with him, just boys. Chantelle Robson, Wade Robson's sister, said that while she might have jumped on the phone just to say hi to Jackson, the main focus of interest would be Wade, and they would talk for hours. Every blue moon I would talk to Michael, like if he called, I'd get on the phone and I'd say, hi, how are you, blah, blah, blah. We'd talk for a couple seconds, but it's not like I... Can, you know, I didn't stay on the phone with Michael for hours or have big conversations. My brother did that. It was sort of, he would call to talk to Wade. Jackson would also have long telephone conversations with Joy Robson, however. And this brings us to the next issue covered by Kenneth Lanning, access to children. According to the analysis by Lanning, pedophiles sometimes marry or befriend women simply to gain access to their children. And according to the Ryan and Richard C. Hall article, A Profile of Pedophilia, quote, pedophiles usually obtain access to children through means of persuasion, friendship, and behavior designed to gain the trust of the child and parent. One thing that was very consistent with Michael Jackson is that he definitely inserted himself into the families of the boys he was friends with, establishing a relationship of trust with the parents, particularly the mothers. We used to spend hours and hours and hours on the phone. He called every day for two years. I felt like he and I had a relationship outside of his relationship with Wade. I felt like we had something s s quite separate. He'd get really lonely and we'd talk about that. Michael, he, he used to ring her all the time. He was a forever ringing her and, and talking to her. The star began calling Damien's mother day and night to offload about his traumatic childhood. He needed someone to, to confide in. My dad would be waiting for my mom in bed for her to come to bed and she would never come. You know, she would be speaking with him in depths on the phone, you know, late in, late hours of the night. I used to cook all his favorite food. I knew I, had, I knew exactly what he loved, and uh, I would make it for him. I, I even uh, would make him homemade pizza and 
he know, loved he's, it. He turkey loved dinner. it. And turkey, turkey dinner. dinner. I came to feel like he was one of my sons by how he behaved. I loved him. He was a son I started to take care for. He would spend the night, I'd wash his clothes. He would stay overnight with these families, sometimes for several nights at a time. And one can imagine how much trust these parents would place in Michael Jackson. So it isn't a far stretch for them to allow their children to go to slumber parties. Which brings us to another observation in the landing behavioral analysis. It says, quote, a skilled pedophile who can get children into a situation where they must change clothing or stay with him overnight will almost always succeed in seducing them. Why can't you share your bed? The, the, the most loving thing to do is to share your bed with someone. But is it really appropriate for a 44-year-old man to share a bedroom with a child who is not related to him at all. That's a beautiful thing. But I have slept in a bed with many children. I sleep in a bed with all of them. See, when you look at these behaviors in the context of the criminal profile for pedophiles, all of a sudden, all these qualities and behaviors that Michael Jackson had that are supposed to be so endearing and innocent aren't so innocent anymore. Aw, oh, but he acted just like a child. Michael was just like a little boy himself. He likes water balloon fights and playing arcade games. It's just a slumber party. And all the time, all these behaviors were lining up with the criminal profile of a child molester, but none of us knew. If you don't know the criminal profile, and who would, only law enforcement knows this stuff, then you wouldn't interpret these behaviors as anything other than innocent and playful. They seem innocuous, but really, they're indicators of a serious underlying problem in an adult. Something I also wanted to draw attention to is this interview Jackson had with Diane Sawyer in 1995. This is two years after the first allegations made by Jordan Chandler. And Diane does something really interesting here. She does a technique in her interview by asking something called the punishment question. It's a technique in interrogation that was developed by John E. Reed in the 1950s. Reed was a polygraph expert and former Chicago police officer. And he developed a technique to create a high pressure environment for interviewees. Part of that method is a behavior provider question called the punishment question, which is used to elicit a response from the suspect that indicates guilt or innocence. The question is usually phrased, what do you think should happen to the person who did the crime? Or what do you think should happen to the person who would do such a thing? The theory is an innocent person would ask for a more severe punishment or characterize a guilty person as someone other than themselves. But a suspect who's guilty would answer the question suggesting a more lenient punishment, such as being given a second chance or receiving psychological treatment. I want you to notice what Jackson's response is. Did you ever sexually engage, fondle, have sexual contact with this child or any other child? Never, ever. I could never harm a child or anyone. It's not in my heart. It's not who I am. And it's not what I'm I'm not even interested in that. And what do you think should be done to someone who does that? To someone who does that, what I think it should be done, gee, I think they need help in some kind of way, you know? Jackson's response is they need help in some kind of way. Pretty lenient, and I would go so far as to say that might even be a subliminal way of saying, I need help. I can't stop. Something else in the Diane Sawyer interview is whenever Jackson is asked about the allegations, he answers that he would never hurt a child. I think I want to begin by making sure that the terms are clear, you have said that you would never harm a child. I want to be specific as I can. Notice when Diane asked him a direct question, he answers with the same phrase, I would never harm a child. Did you ever sexually engage with this child or any other child? Never, ever. I could never harm a child or anyone. I personally believe that Michael Jackson specifically uses that phrase and says that phrase in earnest because he sincerely believes that what he's doing with these boys is just a sincere expression of love and he's not hurting these kids. As Wade Robson says in Leaving Neverland, when Jackson began his sexual abuse, he told him that this is how they showed their love for each other. Him talking to me, you and I were brought together by God. We were meant to be together, you know, and this is us showing each other that we love each other. This is how we show our love. 
There's a 2020 study by Frederica Martin and Leslie Pullman called Sexual Attraction and Falling in Love in Persons with Pedahibphilia. And pedahibphilia is attraction to prepubescent and pubescent children. The researchers conducted an anonymous online survey of 306 men who self-reported as sexually attracted to children. And the majority, 72%, reported on the survey that they had fallen in love with a child at some point in their lifetime. The study found that participants who had an exclusive attraction to children and no interest in adults were more likely to experience feelings of falling in love with a child than participants who also expressed sexual interest in adults. So in other words, these individuals didn't just experience sexual arousal, but also had romantic feelings towards children. And I believe Michael Jackson was the kind of pedophile that fell in love with his targets. I mean, this man would write dozens of letters to these kids and talk on the phone with them for hours. This is the first letter that I ever got from him. Hi, how's my best little friend in the whole world doing? I love you, Wade. I love you, little one. Uh, my best friend forever and all kinds of stuff like that. And I would send stuff back. I truly miss you very much. Thanks for your loyalty and support. I wait for you at Neverland. All my love, always Michael Jackson. He'd have them dress like him with matching outfits and have cute little nicknames for them like Applehead or Doodoo Head. And Robson said he would even sing him a lullaby and call him Little One. These really sound more like romances. Michael Jackson wasn't what's known as a sadistic pedophile, which is someone who derives pleasure or even sexual arousal from hurting their victims. And based on the accounts of Robson, Safecheck, and Chandler, he also didn't use coercion. I think in his mind, he felt he was engaging in consensual romantic relationship with these boys, which is why he might have believed in his head that he wasn't hurting anyone. And it was just an expression of love that other people wouldn't understand. James Safechuck also said during the time he was intimate with Jackson that he was in love and infatuated with him, which may have been another reason why Michael Jackson felt there was nothing wrong with his actions. Which brings me to my next subtopic, confronting a pedophile. According to the Ryan and Richard C.W. Hall article in Focus Magazine, A Profile of Pedophilia, quote, when confronted about engaging in such activities, pedophiles commonly justify and minimize their actions by stating that the acts had educational value, that the child derived pleasure from the acts or attention, or that the child was provocative and encouraged the acts in some way. The behavioral and analysis by Kenneth V. Lanning identifies some common psychological defense patterns in pedophiles. And I'm going to be going over the ones that best match the behavior of Michael Jackson. The first psychological defense is denial. Quote, Usually the first reaction of a child molester to discovery will be complete denial. The offender may act shocked, surprised, or even indignant about an allegation of sexual activity with children. Before I would hurt a child, I would slip my wrist. I would never hurt a child. This is totally false. I was outraged. I could never do something like that. He might admit to an act, but deny the intent was sexual gratification. Is it a crime to hug a child? Why can't you share your bed? The, the, the most loving thing to do is to share your bed with someone. He may imply that his actions were misunderstood and a mistake has been made. And we have busloads of kids who don't get to see those things. They enjoy it in a pure, loving, fun way. It's people with a dirty mind that think like that. I don't think that way. That's not me. His denial may be aided by relatives, friends, neighbors, and co-workers. These associates may be uncooperative and may even hinder police investigation of the offender. Because I know Michael well enough that he wouldn't do anything like that. I know that for a fact. Michael is not. He is not. He is not a pedophile. No, he's not. I know his character. I raised my son and I raised him well. Another defense is sympathy. Pedophiles may resort to a nice guy defense. In this defense, the offender attempts to show he is a pillar of the community, a devoted family man, and a victim of many personal problems. I've helped many, many, many children, thousands of children, cancer kids, leukemia kids. This is one of many. If I am guilty of anything, it is of giving all that I have, all that I have to give to help children all over the world. 
We know Michael Jackson would often speak about his abusive childhood, portraying himself as a victim and target by the media. They lie. They don't want to give me credit for anything. One paper said I had each, because I was growing a little beard, he had each little hair transplanted into his face with a laser, lasered in. How ignorant is that? Lanning's analysis also states that the offender will often try to make a deal in order to avoid a public trial. In the case of Jordan Chandler's allegations in 1993, we know that Jackson chose to pay a settlement to the Chandler family to avoid a criminal trial. The resolution of this case is in no way an admission of guilt by Michael Jackson. The next psychological defense commonly used is the attack. Quote, the pedophile may harass, threaten, or bribe victims and witnesses, attack the reputation and personal life of the investigating officer, attack the motives of the prosecutor, claim the case is selective prosecution, raise issues such as gay rights if the child victim is the same sex as the offender, and enlist the active support of groups and organizations. Jackson never raised any gay rights issues, but he certainly attacked the motives of Santa Barbara County's District Attorney Tom Snedden who prosecuted the case. One of the key arguments made by Jackson's defense attorney, Tom Mesero, in the 2005 trial was that Snedden had a personal vendetta against Jackson because of failing to get a trial and conviction for the allegations made in 1993. Who was he most angry with of all this? I think it's Tom Snedden because it's, he knows it's a personal vendetta that Tom Snedden has against him. And Mesero even requested that the judge remove Snedden from the case. Michael Jackson even wrote a song underhandedly dedicated to the district attorney called DS, supposedly meaning Dom Sheldon. But in the song's audio, it's quite clear Jackson is saying Tom Snedden. And Michael Jackson would also constantly portray himself to the public as a victim of unjust persecution. I have been forced to submit to a dehumanizing and humiliating examination by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff Department and the Los Angeles Police Department earlier this week. It was the most humiliating ordeal of my life, one that no person should ever have to suffer. They manhandled me very roughly. My shoulder is dislocated literally. It's hurting me very badly. I'm in pain all the time. This is, see this arm, this is as far as I can reach it. Stating that the parents of the accusers were driven by money and greed, and that the media only wanted sensationalized headlines to sell papers, Jackson would go on to write lyrics expressing these same sentiments with songs like Tabloid Junkie, They Don't Care About Us, and Money. These were persecutory narratives that Jackson fans would accept hook, line, and sinker. The next psychological defense I wanted to look at is minimization. In Jackson's case, he only openly admitted to sleeping in the bed with children, and that it's only persons with a dirty mind that think there's anything wrong with that. Something I noticed Jackson did for both his interview with Martin Bashir and his interview with Ed Bradley is he used very hyperbolic language, saying things like, who's Jack the Ripper in the room? And if you're going to be a murderer, it's not okay. But is it really appropriate for a 44-year-old man to share a bedroom with a child who is not related to him at all? That's a beautiful thing. That's, that's not a worrying thing? Why should it be worrying? Who's the criminal? Who's, who's Jack the Ripper in the room? As we sit here today, do you still think that it's acceptable to share your bed with children? Of course. Of course, why not? If you're going to be a pedophile, if you're going to be Jack the Ripper, if you're going to be a murderer, it's not a good idea. That I'm not. He does mention that being a pedophile is wrong, but I think using phrases like Jack the Ripper and murderer is a tactic to make what he's doing seem harmless by comparison. Based on the testimony of various alleged victims, Michael Jackson is not violent and he doesn't use force or coercion. And he tries to convince us that him sleeping in the bed with children is charming and sweet. I tuck them in, we put, I put a little like uh, music on, and a little story time, I read a book. It's very sweet. Put the fireplace on, give them hot milk. You know, we have little cookies. It's very charming. 
I definitely think he's trying to appeal to our emotions and change our point of view or recondition us into seeing a grown man sleeping with children as a good thing. One thing I wanted to look at as well were Michael Jackson's very brief marriages to Lisa Marie Presley and Debbie Rowe. But I think this topic deserves a video all by itself because there are a lot of issues here that I wanted to delve into. But all I'll mention here is that in the behavioral analysis manual by Kenneth V. Lanning, it says, quote, because they have a sexual preference for children, pedophiles usually have some difficulty in performing sexually with adults. I want you guys to listen to this experience Michael Jackson had while dating Tatum O'Neill. Tatum started dating Jackson in 1982, so Jackson is 24 years old at this point. And listen to this. So she rings you and says, Michael, come to my house. I'm going to make love to you. Yeah. And you... You're really scared. I'm scared. I'm scared to death. And she told me to go over and, and lie on the bed, and I did. She touched the button of my shirt to open it, and I took my hands like this, and I wouldn't let them down. She just walked away. She, she knew I was too shy for it. Did you not feel tempted at all? You just felt frightened. I was frightened. I was afraid. This is a 24-year-old man who is terrified of having sex with a 19-year-old woman. Therefore, they typically do not marry. Some pedophiles, though, do enter into marriage for specific reasons. And one of the reasons Lanning mentions is that, quote, pedophiles sometimes marry for convenience or cover. We all know that Debbie Rowe's children, which she conceived when she was married to Jackson, were not biologically his. As a matter of fact, a few years ago, a friend of Jackson's, Mark Lester, claimed he was a sperm donor for Michael Jackson's children. You, you say that you were a sperm donor for Michael Jackson. Mm -hmm. and, and you've said, I did give a sperm donation to Michael. I had four children and he said, how do you do it? <laughs> Why, what, what, I mean, how, what, what do you mean, how do you do it? Well, yeah, that's kind of, I, I think, again, extending his <clears throat> naivety, I think he knew how to do it, but he, I think he was, going on the uh, fact of why I was so fertile. I also believe that Jackson conveniently marrying Lisa Marie Presley a year after the first sexual abuse allegations made by Jordan Chandler and just three weeks after she divorced her husband Danny Keough, I think this was some kind of diversion. To show the world, see, I'm straight, I'm normal. I would love to get into a body language analysis of Michael Jackson and Lisa Marie Presley in their various public appearances, but I'm going to leave that for another video. Another thing I saw happening a lot with Jackson is the way he would have these teenage boys sitting in his lap when he was with them. And you see that with Jonathan Spence, Brett Barnes, and Jordan Chandler. And these boys at the time were 12 and 13 years old. These are not toddlers. Or the way he had Gavin Arvizo hold hands and lean against him. Again, like the way you would coddle a young child. The way he's holding these boys isn't age appropriate. You wouldn't expect a boy who is beginning their teenage teenage years to want to be in someone's lap like a little kid or a baby. And look at this picture with him and Jonathan Spence. Look at where Michael Jackson's hand is, right on this boy's upper thigh. Here he is posing half nude with these other boys. And by the way, the final thing I want to look at from the Kenneth Lanning behavioral analysis is a penchant for pedophiles to own child pornography or child erotica. Lanning states, quote, law enforcement investigations have verified that pedophiles almost always collect child pornography or child erotica. They typically collect books, magazines, articles, newspapers, photographs, etc., all relating to children in a sexual scientific or social way. This isn't common knowledge to the public, but the prosecution actually submitted as evidence for the 2005 criminal trial items that were seized during the raid on Neverland by the Los Angeles Police Department in August of 1993 and by the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office in November of 2003. Today the judge saying he will allow the prosecution to enter into evidence two books that were seized from Michael Jackson's ranch back in 1993. The prosecution says 
the books contain nude photos of little boys together. Inside one of the books, an inscription reads, Look at the true spirit of happiness and joy in the boys' faces. This is the spirit of boyhood, a life I have never had and always dreamed of. This is the life I want for my children. It is signed, Michael Jackson. So here's the motion to introduce the articles filed by Snedden. It says, The people seek to introduce numerous homosexual and heterosexual picture books, videos, and magazines seized on November 13, 2003 from the defendant's master bedroom suite at Neverland Ranch. Then here's the list. A book called Boys Will Be Boys containing photographs of boys under the age of 14, full frontal nudity. The book is personally inscribed by Michael Jackson. Another book called In Search of Young Beauty containing photographs of children both boys and girls, some nude. And another book entitled The Boy, a photographic essay, containing black and white photos of boys, some nude. And interestingly enough, this is a book that Michael Jacobs Hagen said Michael Jackson had gifted him with and had also autographed for him. The book uh, called The Boy. This is a book with naked boys, completely naked boys inside. And this is what he gave it to me as a present. This was the, one of the pages here. Um, to Michael, Michael J, my friend, your rubber rubber friend, MJ. So I really don't think it's coincidental that this was also a book that the Santa Barbara County Sheriff's Office seized and submitted as a court exhibit. One of the most significant findings I think is listed in this court document is that they also found a photograph of a boy believed to be Jonathan Spence fully nude. Now the super fans are always going to debate this. They'll say, well, Tom Snedden planted child pornography on the Neverland Ranch premises and then submitted it as evidence for the prosecution and all kinds of conspiracies. But here it is, folks, a document filed on January 18th, 2005 on behalf of District Attorney Tom Snedden listing all the items of child erotica found at the Neverland Ranch. Now Jackson's defense argued that there was also heterosexual pornography that was found which is quote unquote normal for a grown man to own in his house. He found hordes of Playboy, Penthouse, and what I call girly magazines. Right. And they didn't know how to explain this because they knew this could help the defense right. in explaining he's not a pedophile. He's not someone who's enraptured with young males. Mm -hmm. He's a heterosexual male who likes to look at beautiful women who are naked. But it doesn't negate the fact that the man kept nude pictures of underage boys in his bedroom. So I don't know guys, there's a lot from the behavioral analysis, child molester profile, and other studies and research done on pedophilia that Michael Jackson's various odd behaviors match up with. His emotional congruence with children, the way he would insert himself into the various families of the young boys he was friends with, putting himself in a position of trust, his suspicious marriages, excessive interest interest in children, the way he would idealize them and make Neverland a virtual shrine to boyhood, Jackson's own internal dysphoria when it came to his black features and his obsession with cosmetic surgery, as well as his feelings of isolation and loneliness. Over and over, Michael Jackson's idiosyncratic behaviors matched so many of the behavioral patterns associated with preferential pedophilia. Now, does the fact that Michael Jackson's unique eccentric behavior behaviors match up with a criminal profile of a child predator mean beyond a shadow of a doubt that Michael Jackson was a pedophile. No, I think only hard photographic evidence of Jackson actually in the act or DNA forensics could prove that he was. But in my opinion, if it looks like a duck, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, and swims like a duck, it's a duck, man. But what do you guys think? Did you know that emotional congruence with children was a common characteristic of most preferential child predators? What do you think about the observations made in Kenneth V. Lanning's FBI profile and the other research studies of sexual offenders? Were there any suspicious behaviors you noticed over the years about Michael Jackson that I didn't cover in this video? Let me know in the comments below. And please, if you like this video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up, share, and subscribe. I'll see you on the next one. Laters.